welcome everybody back to the Doomer Optimism podcast. Um, today, I'm here with my husband, Patrick, as my co-host, and our guest is Dr. Morris Berman, somebody who I talk a lot about on this podcast, and I'm so thrilled to invite. Um, so first, Dr. Berman, we'll just have you um, introduce yourself, and then we'll jump into the first question. Well, let's see. How should I introduce myself? Do you have any ideas? Any suggestions? <laughs> I mean, I could talk about you from what I know. Morris Berman's just a guy with a very good sense of humor, and he's got it from a long lifetime of reading history, studying, writing about topics such as the collapse of the American empire, the history of human consciousness, two different trilogies, uh, of which we can talk about the specific books as we go through. Um, been a professor in the United States and also in Mexico. Has run a very interesting and stimulating blog since I think it's about 15 years now, right? And continues yeah, 2006 to, was when it started. Yeah. Yeah, and continues to write really thoughtful pieces about cultural history, uh, social critique, history as it unfolds, <laughs> seemingly on a day by day, hour by hour basis, more and more. Uh, and and that's what I have to say about Morris Berman, one of my favorite writers. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I uh, am, uh, you know, an irascible kind of curmudgeon pushing 80. And I've had a very interesting life. Uh, I've uh, taught at a number of universities, and I've written a number of books on, on various subjects. I mean, the last book I wrote, which is called um, Eminent Post-Victorians, is about uh, the British intellectual class in the first half of the 20th century. So it's not really about America collapsing, although... If you look at the people that I selected and talk about, you realize how head and shoulders they are above America in general. So that, that could be seen as a, a, a view on our own collapse. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think this, it's a perfect place to get started. Um, I think for, for listeners who aren't familiar with your own um, specific brand of doomerism, um, the name of this podcast is Doomer Optimism. So a lot of us are uh, hi highly aware of some form of doom or another, um, and then you know are, are looking for places to to thrive um, for the through the rest of our lives um, despite the doom. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, your own work, uh, talking about the collapse of the United States, why America failed, Dark Ages America. Um, maybe some recent examples of, of things you're reading in the news. This is something I, I always enjoy on your blog, um, <laughs> just pointing out the absurdity of daily life. So um, maybe you could, we could start there. Yeah, I mean, the, the United States is, it offers us a daily and constant supply of evidence of why, you know, that it's going down the drain. Um, I could, I don't know if you had an hour plan for this interview, but I could easily... Uh, fill it with depressing uh, information, <laughs> um, you know, but, um, well, I, I mean, I see our decline happening on a micro level, that is that of individuals, and a macro level, that is on the level of government and institutions, and they mirror each other. I mean, that's one, one argument I make in some of my works, that macrocosm and microcosm are interrelated, that they reflect each other. And um, to start with a microcosm, two days ago, a guy named Frank James uh, shot 29 people in a Brooklyn subway. Um, he's now in custody. And when the police went over his videos, uh, it wasn't terrorism at all. You know, I mean, that, that sort of has faded from the scene. He was just uh, somebody who was driven nuts by America. Mm. And I think a lot of Americans are. And so finally he couldn't take it anymore. That's what the videos indicate. Uh, he couldn't take it anymore. And so he just, you know, went to this uh, subway station and began shooting people. And uh, one wonders if he even feels any remorse. The stats of massacres, which is defined as wounding or killing four or more people. The stats are that they're occurring in the United States now at a rate of more than one per day. It seems quite amazing. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, 
But those are the actual statistics. It's something like this 1.1 massacre uh, per day in the United States. And of course, if you would include uh, numbers under four, uh, then that figure gets much bigger. And I can't think of a single country on the planet that duplicates those stats where you could say that there's a massacre of, uh, you know, of a frequency of more than one per day. There's no, no country in the world that has that uh, data. And so that would be a very good example of um, what's happening on a, a micro uh, cosmic level. Uh, that people are just going wild and shooting other people up, you know. Um, and there are a lot of other statistics on a on a micro level. I I just the other day saw some clip on YouTube where some guy had set up a uh, stand like an easel on a street corner. I don't know if it was New York, but he had a map of the world and he was stopping people and saying, uh, "Take a look at this map. Can you name a country?" And typical answer would be something like Africa or South America. And then he would say, well, that, that's a continent. Can you name a, a country within Africa? No way. Not a single person could do it. And then my favorite is, he had a pointer in his hand. Can you point to the United States on this map? Not a single person could do it. No. And, you know, I mean, if you need harder evidence of decline on the micro level, this is it. This is it. We have whole communities being wiped out by opioid addiction, alcoholism, suicide. I mean, the country on a micro level is just doing itself in. On the macro level, I mean, just look at U.S. foreign policy. We have a vice president who's actually a moron. Now, we've had, you know, lots of morons in government historically, uh, but um, H.L. Mencken around, you know, 1929, something like that, predicted that eventually a moron would occupy the White House. I think he wrote that in the Baltimore Sun around 1920. And, of course, then it came true in the case of Bush Jr., George W. Bush. But let's look at who the current vice president is. I mean, she holds press conferences or goes to foreign countries and speaks. And when she's asked a question that she doesn't know the answer to, which is most of the time, she <laughs> just starts laughing. <laughs> and then, and then uh, she um, will uh, do things like, um, uh, what's the kind of... Uh, uh, stuff, uh, she, she'll start laughing. There's one tape of her explaining or trying to explain the war in the Ukraine. And it's like she's talking to a five-year-old. Yeah, I've I seen mean, that she one. She actually says things like, yeah, she says things like, well, there is this very large country called Russia. <laughs> and it has been attacking uh, this very small country called Ukraine. Now, that's wrong. You know, I mean, there's a female comedian who does a parody of her that I hope you can find online. It's also a YouTube clip of laughing and, and, and talking like she was talking to kindergartners and stuff like that. This is the vice president of the United States. I mean, what, what more do you need by way of decline? It's obvious that um, Biden picked her for the diversity vote. Once the election had occurred, he had no more use for her. And right. he hasn't been using her. I mean, she's just a joke. Yeah, she's and, kind of everything that uh, the, they pretended that Dan Quayle was, but she's, she's the Dan Quayle prophecy come true. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course, he was wonderful. You know, he went to Latin America and said, I'd love to talk to you, but I don't speak Latin. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, what can you say? Who are these people, you know? And George Carlin, the comedian, had it very well. He said, you know, where do you think our leaders come from? Mars? You know, they come from the population, and the population is a collection of bozos. H.L. Um, Mencken called them the boobocracy, a collection of boobs. <laughs> and so we have the micro level, 
we have the macro level, and they reflect each other. Um, the craziness over uh, Russia now is really wonderful to behold. You know, Gore Vidal, uh, after he, he read my book, um, Dark Ages America, uh, shortly after that, he was in uh, Toronto and interviewed by the uh, Canadian newspaper, the Globe and Mail. This is, uh, yeah, I mean, you can find uh, that interview online. It's June 9th, 10th of uh, 2006. And the first thing he said was, uh, America is basically just a collection of morons. And after that, he said, stupidity excites me, <laughs> which I, I feel the same way. You know, yeah, there's a big Harris appeal. I get a frisson of joy, you know, when, when somebody can be that stupid, when universities can cancel courses on Dostoevsky because he was Russian. Yes. When we can boycott vodka. <laughs> How long will it be before the students at Harvard burn an effigy of Tolstoy in Harvard Square? <laughs> right. You know, it's don't. It's not far off. You know, no, it's, it's not, it's for, not so at all. far in the. I think that's yeah, yeah. So you're exactly right. At the University um, of well, at the University of Florida, they have these series of little seminar rooms that students can study in, and they're named after famous people. You know, Proust, T. S. Eliot, and so. And one of them is named after Marx. The students campaigned to the administration that. Uh, they didn't want uh, a Russian, uh, a room named after a Russian. They were unaware that Marx was German. <laughs> and what, is it, what, what does it have to do with the war in the Ukraine that will take down Marx's name because yeah. Russia is attacking the Ukraine? You know, and, Guilt and by like three or four degrees is, of association is what ends up happening there. So, yeah. Well, the punchline was that the administration took down the plaque. <laughs> they didn't say they didn't say to the students you're a collection of morons. They took the plaque down. So there's a room you have Proust and Elliot and so on, and then this blank room. You know, I, I mean, one one doesn't know what what more evidence do you need for decline except things like that. So as I said, I, I'm, I'm ranting and raving now. I could go on. Oh, don't worry about ranting, it. But... So <laughs> continuing on that same note. Let me step. I know, I know that. Yeah, we the the assessment of it's 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 a smorgasbord, a buffet that's just you know would put any of the ones in Las Vegas to shame. Just picking what kind of examples we want to show of just how bad things can be, are getting, etc. And I know you've said this many times. You don't have a crystal ball. I'm not asking you to have a crystal ball, but we have talked a, a lot uh, in, on your blog and and you have in your essays and your books about uh, the potential for a more a more full collapse for the United States by the year 2030 or so. And just maybe some ideas of what you think that might look like. I think the last couple of years have shown, you know, fissures that these things can, can get, get broken up in certain ways. But without, without like asking you to look into your crystal ball, uh, by 2030, what might you see happening as far as collapse? And then within a short time thereafter, something else is going to emerge. So I don't know, maybe we just brainstorm some football or, or what do you, what do you think? What do you foresee for the next 10 years in the U S? Yeah. Well, uh, Francis Fukuyama to the contrary, uh, it is not the end of history. You know, I mean, history is not going to end. Here's an example of a very intelligent person writing a very stupid book. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, history doesn't come to an end, but you know, before I talk about, 2030, um, I have to say with regard to this uh, massacre in the Brooklyn subway two days, two days ago, uh, the New York mayor, Eric Adams, uh, in his statements after the event, said that the entire nation is in the grip of a cult of death. His words, his mm -hmm. words, the entire nation is in the grip of a cult of death. And I think that's really important. I mean, God bless him, I have to say. It's, it's time to put that on the table and say that death is hovering over the United States. It has no future except the dark one. And the change, of course, comes out of things like that. Uh, cult of death could also be applied to the Black Plague, you know, in the 
13th and 14th century. Um, and uh, what emerged out of that, of course, was uh, eventually the Renaissance. And so uh, he's right. It's a cult of death. But there is a long-term future. I mean, one would hope. Uh, the short-term future, I think, is going to be very bad. Um, to look ahead at that, just to look at that for a moment, uh, my favorite predictive novel, and there are a number of them around, uh, is the one by Lionel Shriver, which is called, let me think. Amanda Amanda Bulls, Bulls, yes. Baby. I was just thinking about yeah. this book the other day with the amount of predictions or, you know, fictionalization of predictions in that book, which I was drawn to because uh, someone had talked about it on your blog, maybe even you. Yeah, a, a great book for um, kind of the present. Yeah, it's sort of like predicting the next 20 or 30, excuse me, 30 years. And what she predicts is a war of all against all, uh, which is what the United States actually is about anyway. It's just not so overt, but that's what we're descending into now. Uh, we will get even get beyond this business of daily massacres to the fact that you can't go out of your house and everybody has to be armed. And then... Excuse me, that's the vision that she projects. And I think it's coming. I mean, I think it's just very likely the portrait that she paints, paints there. In terms of the, the other part of your question about, you know, what might be beyond that, um, that's hard to say. My own, as you said, I don't have a crystal ball. My own prediction, however, is that the United States will break up. Um, in fact, I think that might be the happiest scenario possible, that there are various secessionist movements around the United States, um, and uh, Vermont, Texas, uh, Northern California, uh, that where there are very strong secessionist movements, and they don't, these, these various parts don't necessarily have the same ideology. But they have the ideology of the end of empire, that um, they are going to be independent areas or states. And within that kind of development, there's the possibility of experiments of a different nature, breaking away from the value system of the United States. That won't happen in Texas, of course, uh, but it will or could happen in Vermont. Uh, which has a very different outlook on how the United States ought to behave, what direction it should go in. And so there's the possibility that on a regional basis, there could be experimentation of different value systems, different ways of living, different types of economies. Uh, you know, one can only hope. <laughs> and, you know, I think on that note, it might be useful to to dig a little bit into um, the Japan book, um, we we when it comes to social decline, we we often think about this um, framing either running away from like a fear response, running away from the collapse versus running toward you know a, a creative response towards something positive. Um, in Neurotic Beauty, you talk about this subset of people who who lock themselves in rooms for years, um, you know, who have really really bad psychological problems. Um, and then there's, you know, another subset that's engaged in sort of a craft revival culture. Um, so I'm wondering, I, the more I, I sort of pay attention to collapse, the more I see these two groups really moving apart. Uh, one really just getting sucked into the cult of death, as you put it, and another, you know, just pushing through and trying to, um, you know, figure out something more beautiful or, or remake from the rubble kind of thing. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that book and what you found there and, um, you know, maybe encouraging people to move towards something affirmative rather than retreating. Yeah, although the retreat might actually be a contribution to historical or social change, because let's get the names right. Uh, the group of Japanese youth that retreat to their bedrooms for 10 years, mostly men, mostly boys, um, that the Japanese word is hikikomori. And these are people that 
basically have rejected the larger society uh, and say, sorry, we're not going to go working for Toyota and Mitsubishi and die of cancer at age 60 and have a stupid, meaningless life. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they're, you know, sequestered in their rooms. Uh, They play video games all day long and that kind of thing. Uh, that, That holds up a mirror to society. In a certain way, it's the conscience of Japanese society. And although, it, you know, it seems on the surface negative, actually, in terms of functioning as a conscience or a mirror, that may be a positive step for Japan if they paid attention. I can't remember the name of his book. Um, Aruki Murakami did a nonfiction book about the release of sarin gas in 1995 on the Tokyo subway by a cult. Um, I can't remember. Um, but you may remember that event from 1995 where they this cult released sarin gas and people died on the Tokyo subway. And, uh, and he wrote a book. I can't, I wish I could remember the title. But um, in it, he said at the end, that the problem was that Japan didn't offer its youth any options. It was basically a withdrawal from society like the hikikomori or go to work for Tokyo, for Toyota and Mitsubishi. Now there is another option. The problem is it's very small, but this is a group that has been called uh, in Japan. I don't, can't remember the Japanese words, the Satori generation. And these are uh, young people who also don't want to waste their lives on the consumer corporate society. Uh, So they withdraw. They move out of Tokyo. They move to the countryside. Uh, Nagano is a a center. Uh, I've been there and they, it's all organic food and that kind of life, the alternative life. And they're great people. The problem is that the Satori generation is about 1% of the Japanese population. And therein lies the problem. You know, a um, century ago, E.M. Forster wrote, uh, you know, he wrote all these wonderful novels, but he also wrote an essay called What I Believe. And in that essay, he said, that he be- believed in an aristocracy of quality, an aristocracy of sensibility, of people who reject that larger society. In his case, it would be the Victorian society. And I, I talk about him in the, in the book on post-Victorians, that um, this is an aristocracy, he said, of the plucky, of the sensible, of people who want to go a different way. But with this caveat, that they will always be no more than the spice of society. They will never be the meat and potatoes of society. Mm. And yeah. that's the problem. Although, although I have to say, he was a member of the Bloomsbury group. So we have Lytton Strachey and um, Virginia Woolf, uh, G. Moore, on the periphery, T.S. Eliot. Um, I would say that although... Uh, the Bloomsbury Circle, you know, didn't overturn uh, the Victorian capitalist consumer society, uh, yet they threw it into question for uh, millions of people. And so the mores, uh, the values of England, changed somewhat because of the Bloomsbury Circle. So although he said we can no more be no more than the spice, uh, the meat and potatoes will continue to march on. Uh, It's not quite that stark because they really did have an impact. Uh, The word that became into use, both in a positive and negative sense for these folks, was bohemians. They were the bohemians of society, and they were pointing to a different way of life, and a lot of people got on that bandwagon. Mm. And so you can see that sometimes... Uh, in certain ways, history is flexible. It yields. And that change, even in a positive direction, uh, is possible. Yeah, and I think if, I'm, if I were to speak for our, our audience, I guess, it, 
a, a lot of us think of ourselves as just, you know, part of a one or two percent group who are um, really seeking some substantively different kind of life um, and and are trying to find each other and sh and, you know, share ideas and inspire one another and um, you know, I think even if we just form a few monasteries <laughs> and, and like you said, the monastic option and just sort of ride out the collapse and protect our own our, our own families and communities or children from the worst of it. Um, you know, I think uh, dedicating ourselves to some kind of life like that, finding finding a meaningful life, um, some some people to model ourselves after um, is the goal. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts. I know you, you've talked about this a lot, but there is a there is a current of this. Um, most of our listeners are in the U.S. Um, there is a current of this um, bohemian alternative um, point of view in U.S. culture. I'm wondering if you might toss out a few uh, names for people to, to dive into in our audience who, who might be worthy people to, to um, look into uh, in terms of craft culture or alternative ways of thinking. Yeah, sure. You know, um, the book I wrote after the uh, book on Italy, which is called uh, Genio, uh, the History of Italian Genius, um, was a collection of short stories, which is called The Heart of the Matter. Yes. At the time, I'm a little embarrassed, because at the time, I did not realize or remember that Graham Greene had written a novel of the same title. So thank God titles aren't copyrighted, you know, so I'm okay. But um, it's called The Heart of the Matter. It's a collection of short stories. And the second, sto excuse me, second story in their collection is also called The Heart of the Matter. And it basically lays out uh, this possibility of secession and the emergence of alternatives. And the authors that I cite there and that I encourage uh, my own readers to look up and follow include uh, John Ruskin, uh, William Morris, famous Brits for alternative ways of living, uh, Lewis Mumford, an American, Mahatma Gandhi, and another American would be Ernest Kallenbach, who many years ago wrote a best-selling novel called Ecotopia, in which um, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California secede from the United States and form a community uh, or an area of the country based on sustainability and not competition, profit, and the thing that drives, you know, the meat and potatoes of American society, the thing that drives us and is driving us into the ground now. I'd also add uh, Neil Postman, who was a hero of mine. Uh, um, yes. Love Neil Postman. Yeah, he was at NYU. He wrote a number of books. Uh, the most famous probably is Amusing Ourselves to Death, which he said, look, you can sit in front of the TV and dream the mass dream and think that becoming rich is what life is all about, or you can try to do something else. You know? yeah. And uh, another would be W.H. Auden, which I feature in the book uh, Eminent Post-Victorians, post uh, the poet. Um, and... Uh, He's so marvelous. I mean, his book, his most famous poem, long poem, is called The Age of Anxiety. And it contains the line, we would rather be ruined than changed. And I think that's true for most Americans. They'd rather go down the drain than adopt a different way of life. Too bad, but, you know, they'll go down the drain. Okay. I, I believe, uh, Prof, I believe we used, sorry to interrupt, but I believe we used a line from an autumn poem in our wedding ceremony ashley and i and i think the the line was that well, we must love each other or die yeah and yeah just odd yeah right happens. and that was the poem called september 1st 1939 yes that's the poem and that poem uh got uh widely disseminated and popular in the wake of 9 11 because it also took was in september you know uh September 1st, 1939, was the day that Hitler invaded Poland. And um, the other September, of course, is September 11th, 2001. And at that point, that poem got resurrected and was very popular. 
But yeah, that's right. We must love each other or die. And most people will say, okay, I'll die. <laughs> no, um, there's always a nugget that? like that every time you know every time you're in an interview you'll just like pull out one of these uh out of nowhere and just crack up whoever <laughs> so that's exactly the right, thing you know is that's the choice and people don't want to don't want to make the the obvious uh, humane choice and okay i have a question that ties in with the heart of the matter um which was centers around a, a, a man who's trying to to kind of he he wants to further this movement not not it's not a spoiler or anything just a brief summary to the the premise uh, a movement of authenticity and he meets together with with certain people uh his his wife uh some students some people who are young people in in the city where they live and they get together for meetings and they get more into the practicality of how to kind of uh, live a more authentic life and so tying in with that and going back to your other books from the from the uh, 70s and 80s coming to our senses and re-enchantment of the world this idea of of embracing a mysterious uh, like an antidote to to scientific rationality instrumental rationality without like turning into a new age cult and i know you had said before that your book uh, re-enchantment of the world a lot of new age people really liked it a lot but you often have talked about the importance and the need to not try to become a guru but to just have principles so Ashley's question has been this. Is there a normal person's way to just like embrace mystery, um, authenticity, authenticity uh, trying things in a different way without becoming a guru, weirdo cult figure? Because <laughs> she's very paranoid and conscious about this, self-conscious. And it's something I think that deserves uh, some discussion. Well, returning to one of our band authors, Dostoevsky, I remember in the Brothers Karamazov, there's a section called the Grand Inquisitor, where Christ comes back to Earth, and the Grand Inquisitor uh, questions him about what his effect was, and uh, what does he think he's doing now, and so on. And the Grand Inquisitor finally says, uh, the great hope of all humanity, find someone or something to worship and that's unfortunately the truth yeah. uh, Dostoevsky had it right that for 99 plus percent of the population it's just let me find something or somebody to worship and then I'll be okay there was I mean one of the people that I feature in eminent post-victorians is uh, Arthur Kessler was born Hungarian, but became a naturalized British citizen, which is what he's doing in the book. Um, but Kessler was a guy, a very fascinating person to me, uh, because he was endlessly chasing something or somebody to worship. That was the story of his life. He went from Zionism to communism to anti-communism, finally wound up in parapsychology or new age thinking, you know. Um, but it was always this driven, uh, this, this drive to find a paradigm that he could finally embrace forever and live in forever. And he failed. I mean, they all didn't work out because no paradigm has all the answers. And at the end of his life, he said, came to the conclusion that the one thing that was destroying the human race was devotion, by which he meant this funda fundamentalist worship of a thing or a person or, or a paradigm or something. And he said, the only hope for humanity is if scientists develop a pill to counteract devotion. On that note, he committed suicide. Oh. Now he had Parkinson's, yeah, he had Parkinson's disease, he had leukemia. I mean, there were contributing factors. But to me, the major factor was that he had run out of options. Mm. You know, he tried everything. And uh, he was searching for something to worship, and in the end, he couldn't find it. So what he suggested was, we stop doing that. And he stopped oh. it by killing himself. Yep. Um, you know, hopefully there are better answers to that. But again, this is something that is unfortunately 
restricted to something like 1% of the population. And what I'm talking about is uh, self-transparency. The ability not just to get lost in the other paradigm, but to see through your own impulse to embrace a paradigm. Yep. Why are you doing that? What is in your soul that you need to believe in whatever it is? And that can include environmentalism and sustainability. Yep. Uh, you can make a religion out of that as well. Um, the, the real problem is, Kessler pegged it, is the problem of religion. It's devotion. And, you know, the root of religion, ligare, in Latin means to tie tie up. And so what are you tied to that you can't step back and just look at this lust, this erotic uh, desire to have something that's going to make your life completely meaningful? Mm-hmm. You know, there's a very famous passage in the writings of, um, of Arthur Kessler. I think it's in the book called Arrow in the Blue where he talks about his conversion to Marxism. And he says that when I read Marx's work, it was like light streaming across my skull. And I awoke to the reality that this was the answer. And one can't help thinking of Eric Hoffer's famous book, The True Believer. Because Tesler had done the same thing with Zionism earlier on. Then that didn't work out, and so he embraced Marxism and worshipped that for a while. And then he became the world's preeminent anti-communist without realizing that the zeal that he had for anti-communism was the same zeal that he had for communism. (laughs) Um, a A lot of Americans went this route as well. Whitaker Chambers, for example, who became very famous uh, Nixon, uh, pro-Nixon guy and uh, anti-communist and uh, was uh, famous for hiding uh, tapes, uh, incriminating tapes in a pumpkin in his backyard. (laughs) Um, So, you know, I mean, American history is nothing if not hilarious. (laughs) And, um, And Chambers once said to a friend, you see how I've changed. And the friend said, Whitaker, you haven't changed. You just changed sides. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly well, the I, issue. That's exactly, yeah. You know, when are you going to stop this feverish adulation of people, ideas, and things and say, what am I doing? What is it that's driving me to do this? You know, I don't know if it's true, but somebody once wrote me that the most quoted line on the Internet comes from my book, Coming to Our Senses. And that line is, ideas are something you have. An ideology is something that has you. Yep. Wow. Well, that, I've used that one myself. <laughs> <laughs> and well, so I think, I think for me, for me, the danger is that the ideology that comes, <clears throat> what would, comes with the ideology is the people and then the power structures and then the way people use the ideology to control one another as opposed to some of the things you talk about in coming to our senses and re-enchantment of the world and we can get into wandering god too um which do have an inherent meaning and authenticity to them um and i think i guess I'm maybe just paraphrasing um you know the 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 goal here is is to is to try to seek that sort of authenticity without getting um, just taken up, swept up in some kind swept, of swept up paradigm. In, in the paradigm shift addiction or the 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 sense of um, the belonging and community that gets you that you get into from having a certain ideology. Like you know, how can we pursue this authenticity and this um, this meaning and this depth and this embodiment uh, without getting swept up into you know cultish behavior? Yeah, it's, that's, that's to me the crucial challenge. And I think uh, Kessler did put his finger on it. That, you know, I mean, as far as the meds weren't available when he committed suicide, which I think is uh, 1983, something like that. Um, 
the, the meds just weren't available. But um, now we have Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil and all kinds of things that can dampen your devotion. But, you know, I mean, I don't think he was tongue-in-cheek when he said that. We need to develop a pill. We have developed those pills. We right. have them now. They just basically, they just crush your consciousness into blandness. So, you yeah. you know, you just sit around drooling. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's it's uh, kind of a, a not, not the greatest solution in the world. So if we say uh, with Kessler that the greatest danger to the human race is devotion, the question is, how do you stop doing it without chemical support? Right. You know, let's let's put all those drugs aside. After all, that was the theme of Brave New World. Everybody yep. was zonked out on a drug called Soma. That was the vision that Huxley had. And um, in his latest, his final book, uh, which I think is called Islands, uh, he his solution, uh, the alternative to Soma, was that people were living on this island and birds were flying over it and they were birds who could talk. And what they kept saying was, be here now. You know, mm -hmm. if you can just manage to live in the present and see who you are, what you're doing, and so on, that is freedom. But, you know, what you want to avoid is an island cult or a be here now cult because right. uh, that that's not going to advance your Huxley cult. That's not going to further uh, your own development. But this is a very difficult uh, balance. It's, it's a yep. very hard road to hoe. Well, on that note, this reminds me so much of um, your book, Wandering God, um, which makes a sort of argument about Paleolithic versus Neolithic consciousness. And I read this book before having children as a, as a young woman. And it totally changed my whole perspective towards child rearing. Um, yes, you know, I, Pro sorry. Professor Berman, just so you know, you had more influence on Ashley than any Dr. Spock or any of these, you know, <laughs> books, you know, <laughs> well, bookstore I, bait. Okay, well, I'm flattered, I, I'm flattered. I, I, had never I, heard, hope hope. I had never heard somebody, I had never heard some, or read anybody talking about transitional objects like safety blankets, um, birth spacing, um, extended breastfeeding as p playing a role in a, in a sort of like horizontal consciousness. Um, and what, what I think people might call secure attachment in, in modern psychological parlance. And, um, you know, I think one of the most transformative things I thought I could do was to raise my children in this way so that they just start off life with a sort of be here now, ability to maintain their presence, uh, secure attachment kind of thing. Um, I wonder if you meant to write this book uh, with a, <laughs> with like a young mother in mind, because I don't know of anyone else who read it who 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 uh, who acted the way I did. But um, you know, I'm I think a lot of people who listen to our podcast also are young families and. Um, they're interested in protecting their kids from the worst of it and um, maybe raising their kids in a way that's um, it will, will make their kids' lives and their, their journey easier. Just kind of, yeah, better equip them psychologically to deal with uh, what's probably going to be a very hard time. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, hard times are definitely coming, but to answer your earlier question, I was not really writing uh, that particular chapter in Wandering God, uh, you know, for pediatric <laughs> uh, <laughs> reasons. But um, what I was trying to get down to was uh, the way that the transitional object, the teddy bear, Linus's blanket, whatever, uh, which we can summarize in the word attachment, uh, that how that gets played across the entire cultural field. And that was the argument that the, I mean, the guy who came up with the concept, transitional object, was a British psychiatrist and pediatrician by the name of Donald Winnicott. And that article dates from 1951, 53, something like that. And what he said was that eventually we give up the teddy bear, you know. And what happens is that the attachment energy gets spread across the field into ideologies and religions. And that's why we fiercely defend uh, our consciousness, our identities, and why people would say 
faced with Auden's choice, uh, we would rather be ruined than changed. They'll say, okay, I'll be ruined. Because the whole notion of living without that extreme fanatic attachment seems impossible. I mean, look at the uh, frenzy uh, currently now in the United States of anti-Russian hatred. You know, I mean, the truth is that that situation is very complicated. And uh, as people like Scott Ritter or John Mearsheimer, Glenn Greenwald, others have pointed out, um, for 15 years, Putin was trying to get the U.S. government to sit down with him and talk about his concerns about Russian border safety. And they wouldn't do it. The most recent attempt was this last December. They simply wouldn't listen to him. They, so finally, what does he do? He blows a stack because nothing else is going to work. And that is not talked about. Instead, we get into a frenzy, this anti-Russian frenzy. And why? Because it feels good. Yeah. Devotion and attachment feel really good. And you don't have to ask too many questions about reality. You can just be in this kind of rush that's no different than a heroin rush or a cocaine rush. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, since attachment is, as Winnicott said, and also John Bowlby, who wrote the book on attachment, uh, attachment is fundamental to the human being. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be sucking at the breast. Attachment is crucial to our development, but can it ever can we ever mature to the point of view that we can take a point of view on attachment, that we can see through attachment, that we can maintain some degree of attachment without becoming fanatical about our attachment, without falling into what Kessler called devotion, or the Grand Inquisitor about we're always running around trying to find something to worship. Uh, that That is the balancing act that is required, but it doesn't mean uh, the end of attachment, and that's where uh, I, I may consider myself, excuse me, something of a Buddhist, but that's where I disagree with them because basically they want to do away with desire. I don't think that's a good idea, and I don't think it's possible. Uh, attachment has positive value, but like anything else, we have to be careful of extremes. Mm -hmm. There is an anthropologist, I guess he's dead now, an American anthropologist, Robert Schwader, years ago, who said, you know, uh, any ideology, probably with the exception of fascism, any ideology is okay if you don't go overboard with it. And that's, that's the whole thing. You know, there's this wonderful novel by Richard Powers called Gain, which describes two brothers who are selling tallow and candles and wax down at the Boston docks in the late 18th century. And they get this little business going and it's really a, a neat, you know, and they're enjoying themselves and it's a community kind of activity and so on. And 200 years later, that little enterprise has morphed into a giant, a giant big pharma corporation that's polluting rivers and <laughs> inventing diseases and drugs that we don't need and so on and so forth. And Powers really, I mean, that book won the, for that year, I can't remember when, 1985, something like that, it won the award for historical fiction by the Organization of American Historians and uh, well-deserved because what it shows is that size and scale are extremely important factors in this whole discussion. When it was just a small kind of neat little hustling operation down at the, at the Boston docks, it was like benevolent capitalism. Yes. But 200 years later, you know, following the historical forces, it turned into male malevolent capitalism. And so size and scale, degree of devotion, all that sort of degree of attachment, all that thing, all those things uh, have to be taken into account. The United States, individually on the micro level and on the macro level, the governmental level, is not interested in moderation. 
They're simply not interested in it. And that spells out uh, our future decline. Yeah. Well, something that we often talk about in Doomer Optimism and with some other people online is the idea of localism and how that's a, a potential like space and and. and and reason for optimism as things we've seen how supply chains have been so interrupted and so tenuous and fragile in the last couple of years here. Now, what you've just described, however, it's like the question becomes, is it in the in the United States case, for example, is it in their, the character of the people enough to exercise that restraint, to push for something local? As I think we know what you just said it yourself. At the government level, at the macroeconomic level, no, there's been no indication of that ever, I don't think. There may be little blips that run contrary to that, but as a whole, no, probably not. So then how do you deal with that as an individual? Well, maybe it's a question of focusing on yourself, on your own community, on your own region a little more. Um, so what do you think about, about the chance and the potential for localist or regional type, um, beyond what you've already talked about? Um, political futures well, or economic futures to develop. Yeah, ultimately, that's all you can do. You know what I mean? It's sort of like history has holes in it. It has wormholes. It has accidents. This is something that Gary Snyder raised. You know, in 1965, he published a book called Turtle Island. It won the Pulitzer Prize. And there's an essay in that collection. I mean, Snyder is, to me, one of our national treasures. And in the essay, Four Changes, he talks about the fact that history does have wormholes. And you can never be 100% sure where something is going to lead. And um, I I quote this at the end of, let me read this, I quote this at the end of the Twilight book. Uh, he was a friend of Snyder's, uh, beat poet. Lou Welsh, um, and the poem is untitled, but I love it because it's basically uh, an illustration or an elaboration of what Gary was talking about. So, short poem. What strange pleasure do they get who'd wipe out whole worlds, anything to end our lives, our wild idleness? But we have charms against their rage, must go on saying, look, if nobody tried to live this way, all of the work of the world would be in vain. And now and then a son, a daughter, hears it. And now and then a son, a daughter, gets away. That's exactly it. You can't know with these individual local experiments how history is going to turn. When the Bloomsbury Circle formed, it was informal. You know, they weren't taking attendance at meetings. Uh, it was a very loose group, but basically it cohered in a way that did really influence England, uh, the customs, mores, value systems, uh, in significant ways. Um, he, it was a plea for authenticity, and they made it, and they made a very good case for it, and they influenced a lot of people. You can never be sure about these wormholes. You can never be sure about where history is going to take you. And frankly, what else should you do with your life? I mean, that was the, you know, you the choice something. that Haruki. Yeah, I mean, what Haruki Murakami was talking about was that uh, Japan was not giving its youth alternatives. But the alternative is, like the Satori generation, uh, you can spend your life accumulating money and uh, buying bigger and bigger houses and cars and basically wasting your life on crap. Or you can try these alternative experiments that may not go anywhere, but you don't know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, basically, that is the, the, that's the whole theme of this podcast is who, who's working on the experiments, what are they doing, what's working well, what's not, um, inspiration, but also just like tips and tricks. I mean, a lot of people are raising kids differently. They're thinking about um, marriage in a different way, about work, about economies. Um, we've got a lot of people who are, you know, keeping chickens and goats and, and trying to do that with their family and, and kids and show them how that all works. So, so 
Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's basically the perfect uh, note to end on. But I, I do want to give you a moment to um, uh, to plug your new book and talk a little bit about it more than you have um, already before we go. Sure. I mean, the, the latest the latest book is called Eminent Post-Victorians. And it is a series of cameos, 10 people. I've already mentioned, let's see whom I've mentioned. I've mentioned Virginia Woolf. I've mentioned uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, I have mentioned Arthur Kessler uh, and also uh, W.H. Auden. They're all in there. So there, there are 10 characters that I see as being very significant on uh, the British cultural scene. Uh, and um, it's, it's portraits of people who really were bohemians and insisted on going their own way. They weren't going to play the game of the larger society because they saw that it was empty and a dead end. And, you know, I mean, I again, we Ian Forster is one of those portraits, and what he said is true, uh, that you, you can, you'll always be the spice of society and never the meat and potatoes. But uh, the society needs the spice, and mm. you don't know where that's going to lead. You just don't know where that's going to lead. So that's, that's Eminent Victorians. And then the, the book before that was the one I mentioned, uh, the collection of short stories called The Heart of the Matter. And one reason I'm proud of that is that it's a very funny book. <laughs> and so I, li I like that fact that um, uh, it's extremely funny. You know... Uh, Bertrand Russell in 1918 was put in jail for urging uh, Americans not to enter World War I. And so he was in jail, and he was reading Lytton Strachey's book, Eminent Victorians. And Eminent Victorians is a very, very ironic and witty book. And at one point, he was reading, he was sitting in his cell, and he was reading it, and he started laughing out loud. And the warden came by and said, excuse me, Lord Russell, but prison is a place of punishment. <laughs> Excellent. Morris Berman, uh, the publisher of those last two books uh, and, and where people can find it if they want to try to purchase it? Well, Am Amazon is the best location for ordering any of my stuff because my stuff doesn't appear in bookstores and there aren't any bookstores anymore anyway. Yeah, the, yeah. So, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, they may, maybe there are a few. But, um, uh, and the book before that was the book about Italians called Genio, yeah. uh, the story of Italian genius. And there are all that, all that stuff is available on Amazon. If any of your listeners just plug my name into Amazon.com, it'll it'll just spill spill them all out. Excellent. And then we had one question from uh, from my fr my friend Diogenes, who I met on your blog years ago, and he just wanted to know because he's like a person with a very wide range of interests and write on a lot of things, including. Uh, uh, classical literature and uh, philosophy of mind, et cetera. And his question that he wanted me to ask you while I had you on was, with all these areas of interest and so many things about which to write, are there any areas, history, culturally, et cetera, uh, that you think are really neglected and that more people ought to be writing about or, mm. or researching or looking into? Like, is there an area that's come up on your writer that you think, like, this is really ripe for, for more scholarship, for more... Um, Fiction, nonfiction, whatever. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I mean, I can't speak for other writers. I can just say that for me, um, it's not like I sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to write a book about this topic. What yeah. happens is that something catches my attention. Mm. And it may be some, it may be a well plowed furrow, like, like uh, the B Bloomsbury Circle, but still, I'm excited about it, and that's all I need to know. And so it's sort of like, uh, n not like you can create a syllabus in which you say, well, this area has been covered, this area has been neglected, and so on. You know, I just um, would say to uh, any prospective writer, uh, watch your body reaction, yeah. because that's what I pay attention to. If when I was about to write, uh, I didn't know I was about to write it, The Reenchantment of the World. I remember being at a party for graduate students, of which I was one at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this goes back to, what, 1968, something like that. And I remember saying to a fellow graduate student, what if it turned out that the scientific 
uh, worldview of the 17th century was simply an ideology. <laughs> and as, he, as I said that to him, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Mm. Yeah. And I knew I had a book. So you have to follow your body. Yeah. It's, and, it's funny that that trilogy yeah, has to I do mean, a lot I about mean, being embodied and, and, and paying attention, to, especially coming to, your, to our senses. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when my mouth runs dry and I feel that it's almost erotic, you know, this, this kind of desire that, oh, now I'm on the right track. That, yeah. that the body, what's the, what's that famous line from, uh, Bessel van der Kook, the body keeps the score. That's right. That's where it is. Excellent. So Morris Berman, we didn't get to talk about a bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about. And actually, I think with what you just said. Um, your books, your best books, I think, Neurotic Beauty, Wandering God, they incorporate so many different things. And I think this is another thing. This is my opinion for, for that question, which is people, I think, to, tend to write too many or deal with things in too siloed a fashion. And I really have appreciated in your career how you've tied together a lot of different things from, for example, Wandering God, um, you know, anthropology, um, ch child rearing, history, psychology, uh, psychology uh, myth all these different things. And I think that's something that people should keep their eyes open for. We didn't get a chance to talk about a bunch of concepts that your books have, have uh, dealt with, including negative identity, um, filling the void in, in Zen Buddhism from neurotic beauty, which a couple of questions ago, I thought we could talk about that, but unfortunately we don't want to keep you all day. Thank you so much for being here on Doomer Optimism. And um, I don't know anything else to say before well, we go. Thank you. I, I really appreciate Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, hey, six months or a year from now, let's do it again. Yeah. Do you have any other books that you're currently working on? Or is anything uh, tickling the hairs on the back of your <laughs> neck at the moment? <laughs> no, no. I'm, I, after I finished uh, Eminent Victorians, I realized that my body was saying, you know, I'm very tired. Take a rest. <laughs> right now, I'm taking a rest. All right. Good. Professor Morris Berman, thanks again for being with us on Doomer Optimism, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye now. All right, bye-bye.